it's the great humility, the great time. I look at these outstanding speakers, and I'm going to give them to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janet. shared in this last hour, one of the great untold stories, among the many untold stories of this conflict, is the stories uh, and the reality of the active, present, ongoing, creative and courageous uh, nonviolent resistance, both by Palestinians and Israelis. The people sitting uh, at this table have been actively engaged either for a short time or for a lifetime. Uh, in that very uh, act uh, of resistance, of injustice, of human indignity, of illegality, and of trying desperately through their own personal actions and life stories and life witness to stand in solidarity uh, on the side of humanity, on the side of dignity, on the side of freedom and justice and true security. Uh, and so what we try and want to do in the panel is to give each person a few minutes to share just one story, one glimpse of, of that uh, courageous nonviolence uh, from their life or from uh, the life of uh, someone that they know or experience that they uh, know of. And then again, like we did last night in the panel, to open up and allow you to ask some more direct questions. Uh, Anna said because she's just finished an hour, she'll save the five minutes so that we have more questions. Uh, and so uh, we start uh, with Jeff, and I will try to, to watch pretty hard on the five minute clock, and I'll turn the microphone off on Jeff, which is a, we've been doing the Jeff and Sandy show for a lot of years, so uh, this should work out pretty well. So Jeff, let me give you the mic. Well, <clears throat> I, mean, I should speak about a courageous Israeli nonviolent resistance. You have people like Noam here who are, res who are refusers, that refuse to serve in the occupied territories. And there are my kids, my three kids who refuse to serve in the Israeli army. My youngest son served three, month, three months in prison before he was able to get out of the army altogether. But on the other hand, uh, we Israelis, being Jewish Israelis, like I mentioned last night, have a privileged position. We're certainly not we try to be there for the Palestinians. We resist in ways that we can, but, uh, but nevertheless, we're protected. You know, we're, we're, they're not going to, to beat us or shoot us, although there have been, especially between some Israeli protesters that have been shot because they thought they were, and uh, the soldiers said we didn't know they were Israelis. Um, and, uh, and so, Maybe I'd just like to take a minute and mention, you know, I was nominated this year for the Nobel Peace Prize by the American Friends Service Committee. <laughs> Which was an, uh, really an honor, and it and gives a lot of credibility to our work, of course. But I was nominated together with Rasan Andoni, who is a, a Palestinian intellectual um, activist. He was one of the founders of, of the ISM, or the International Solidarity Movement, uh, a professor of physics at Pierzette University. Uh, uh, he's now the spokesman of Pierzette University. He r runs an organization called Rapprochement that during the Oslo years tried to engage in dialogue with Israelis. But, he, but He's, he was one of the leaders of what was one of the really most courageous and, and absolutely stunning acts of resistance, in my view, that the Palestinians ever mounted to the, to the occupation. That, that really hasn't got, it really deserves to be a film. And that was a tax revolt in Beit Sapur in 1987, that Rasal Andoni was one, of, was one of the heads of. Beit Sapur was a Christian um, town, almost a, really a suburb of, of Bethlehem, um, that in 1987, at the outbreak of the first intifada, declared a tax revolt against the Israeli authorities and declared that they were not going to pay their taxes to uh, any taxes to uh, basically Palestinians subsidize the occupation. I have to say, by the way, as uh, just to think about it, if you saw the terminals that are being built, these huge terminals, these facilities in, in the wall, 
They're being paid for by the Palestinians. In other words, the, the Americans uh, uh, budget money for Israeli security, for, pa no, I'm sorry, for, Pal for, Palestinian, for Palestinian security. One of, if the Americans support the Palestinians in any way, is that they try to support their police and military uh, branches for security. But the United States takes out of the security budget that it gives to the Palestinians the costs of the terminals. These huge terminals that Israel is building in the walls. So in some ways, the Palestinians are paying for their own imprisonment in that sense. And in many ways, and so the Palestinians in Beit Zahur did not want to and sub subsidize the occupation or support it in any way. The civil administration that we talked about, uh, where I showed you those officials that destroyed Salim Arabia's house, uh, the entire cost of the civil administration and its staffs and everything, all the costs of Israel administratively in the occupied territories is taken out of Palestinian tax money. Israel doesn't put one dime into all the infrastructures of control that it has in the occupied territories. It's all taken out of money and if the Palestinians are poor and there's not tax to, to, to take the money from, they just don't get the services. Israel won't put the money in to even maintain a minimal amount of services. And, and so the people of Beit Zahur, and it was really a mass popular revolt, said we are not going to pay the taxes to the Israeli occupation authorities. And declared a strike, and they had hoped that the strike would spread to other West Bank uh, towns and cities in Gaza, which it didn't. Uh, and Beit Zahur became very isolated. And Israel came down on Beit Zahur. I don't think the town until today has recovered. Israel came down and stripped all the stores, every store in town, the houses of people, everything, just stripped the town of all its property, all its financial resources, it, you know, saying that this is a, a, a fine and a punishment for, uh, for paying arrears on taxes and so on. And it was a tremendously uh, courageous, I mean, courageous understates the case, I think, uh, act of resistance among Palestinians because I can't begin to convey to you, and I don't know really where it comes in our culture, uh, the ruthlessness and the coldness and the absolute, if there's any word, it's disproportionate. The disproportionate response of Israel to any, to any uh, uh, challenge to its authority or to, any, um, or to any resistance, certainly. So when we talk about resistance for Palestinians, we're talking about a resistance that meets, that meets a, a firewall of, of, of response, uh, which makes it, uh, you know, even, even more courageous after all these years. But I think certainly to say to, uh, to, to in this context, to give a tribute to mention Rasan Andoni and the people of Beit Sahur that led that tax revolt would, would be appropriate. Thank you, Jeff. No? Okay. Hi. Um, so I'm sitting uh, less so on the table of courageous um, resistors because what we do really isn't that courageous, we just say no. Um, and it's actually a result of being sort of cowardly before because we did serve in the army and I was in some of these situations that you saw on Anna's um, presentation wearing a uniform. So, well, well you, it's very shameful. Um, you, you do these things and uh, you don't realize how dehumanizing you are. And I think one of the reasons we're so disproportionate is to live with it, you sort of have to put a screen and you stop seeing the people on the other side as people. And then it just rises and rises. And at a certain stage, the level of shame really hits a high. And then you, that's, that's at least for me what caused me to refuse because it's just so shameful. So it's very hard to see these thighs. Not because for some of you there are things that you might have seen for the first time or even if you've seen before they make it more real. It's because these are things I've done and I was there. And they're very, very real to me. Unfortunately, they're really not that real to all the Israelis. And um, that's the second part of my refusal. What we tried to do, what was very effective for a while, was to try and show Israelis what this really is. What a gentleman asked me yesterday if or brought out a statistic and said that most Israelis want peace, and I'm sure most Israelis do want peace. 
Except that we, a lot of Israelis don't understand wanting to peace, but wanting to hold on to the entire West Bank and to the settlements and to dehumanize the Palestinians the way that occupying the West Bank requires will never bring peace around it. What we try to do is we try to put up a map, a mirror, and show them just what that really means. Um, because it's a blindness that isn't really willful. It's just sort of there. It's the way, it's just the way we run our lives day to day. And people don't stop and think about it. And my type of resistance was to try and just show what it really means to be an occupier. So it's not quite as uh, dangerous. And I'm sitting next to, um, uh, you know, I'm really humble. So I guess that's what I have to say. I'm Cindy Corey. I'm here because of my daughter, Rachel Corey. Uh, she brought our family, our entire family, many of whom are here in the room, uh, to this issue. Rachel uh, traveled in uh, March or in January of 2003 uh, to Israel, uh, to the West Bank, to be trained with the International Solidarity Movement, and then to uh, Rafa in the southern, the very southern tip of the Gaza Strip. The ISM uh, was an organization that was founded after a uh, resolution was introduced in the United Nations by the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson, to have a peacekeeping force go to the region after the start of the Second Intifada. That resolution was vetoed by the United States and by Israel. And it was at that point that uh, Ghassan Andoni, uh, who is Palestinian, the, the, man, the gentleman that Jeff was speaking of, uh, Neda Golan, who is an Israeli and continues to work with ISM, um, Adam Shapiro, a Jewish American, and his wife, Huweda Araf, a Palestinian American, uh, came together and co-founded the International Solidarity Movement. There are only two stipulations for being a part of ISM. One must believe in the right to freedom for the Palestinian people. Uh, according to uh, United Nations resolutions and international law, and one must agree to use only nonviolent direct action forms of resistance. Rachel was killed on March 16, 2003. Uh, 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 only a piece of her work, I should say, was to stand in front of bulldozers, but it was a piece of her work there. And on that day, uh, she died when she was trying to resist the demolition of a Palestinian home, um, a home that belonged to really two families living at home, in a home, a pharmacist and an accountant and their five young children who were behind the garden wall uh, that she stood in front of that day. Their home was uh, subsequently destroyed. Um, there were seven international eyewitnesses with Rachel that day. Um, one of them, Joe Carr, is over there. I feel a little guilty because uh, Joe is, is one of the people who, uh, internationals, who really does this work and continues to do it. Uh, so uh, he has a lot to, to say about all of this as well. Um, in December uh, 2005, Mubarak very kindly asked um, my husband and I to come to a conference, on, an international conference on nonviolence in Bethlehem, which was an extraordinary experience for us. Internationals came from around the world. Um, Israelis made the journey there, and that's a challenge for many of them if they don't have an American passport. Um, and we, we were with some who made that journey, uh, people who are, are also doing this work uh, in Moxham Watch uh, with the Israeli Committee Against Home Demolitions and other groups. But for me it was really fascinating to hear the discussion among the Palestinians who were um, reviewing the different forms of nonviolent and discussing and debating the different forms of nonviolent uh, resistance that they've been using. Uh, it was such an inspiration to hear their discussion and to know that there was strategizing and planning going on, um, much of it, you know, led in by Mubarak. Um, after a couple of days, I needed to go where some of the uh, resistance work was happening, and I traveled, uh, Craig and I traveled to Belém, 
which is a small Palestinian village. Uh, Craig says you go to Ramallah and you turn left. And uh, we went, we were taken there with uh, Palestinian members of ISM, with international members of ISM. Uh, we were, uh, they discussed on the way some of the things that we needed to know about the possibility of tear gas being thrown, uh, of the possibility of rubber bullets being shot and uh, gave us, talked to us about what might happen. But the day that we got there, it was, a, it was a sunny day. In some ways, it was like a picnic. As we walked up the path, however, we saw Caterpillar equipment being used to create uh, the wall that's going through that village, taking 60% of the land. Um, we saw the settlement, the new settlement building and expansion that was happening uh, at, which is why the wall is coming through. And we had pointed out to us where the green line actually was far beyond this settlement. Uh, we were uh, encircled by Palestinians when we came who greeted us and um, welcomed us. I sat with the women and the children who sang a woman uh, drumming on a, 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 water, a large blue water jug and the children, the, the girls, young girls, leading the songs. I don't have Arabic, so I clapped along. And it was uh, one of the most uh, extraordinary afternoons of my life to be there with them. Uh, Craig talked with uh, many of the people that were there as well. And, and one gentleman, uh, we, because we don't have Arabic and we don't have Hebrew, there was translation going on uh, between three people. Uh, one, uh, an uh, Arabic speaker, Palestinian, uh, knew Hebrew and uh, also Arabic, of course. And then he was speaking to an Israeli uh, who, in Hebrew, and then the Israeli was translating to Craig uh, into English. And we thought that that was very symbolic of the kind of work that's happening there. One of the things that I think is so important for you to think about and that I felt that day is that we need to let people here know that this is happening. We need to let people know that there are Palestinians at the lane. It's one of the things that I've tried to do since I came back. Senator Hillary Clinton was in the West Bank a few weeks before we got there, and she stood on the uh, uh, Jerusalem side of the wall surrounding Bethlehem, and I saw news reports of her saying that the wall was justified because of Palestinian violence. She didn't mention that the wall uh, was not on, on Israeli land, but was on Palestinian land. Uh, I felt compelled after being at Belain, you know, to come back and shout, please go to Belain and see what's happening there. Because we need to let people know if we don't pay attention to the nonviolent resistance that's occurring, uh, then it can't have the effect uh, that we all want it to have. Um, I'm going to just mention, uh, this is really important to me as well, uh, at the conference, Rachel and Tom Herndall, who were both uh, ISM uh, participants, were honored along with nine Palestinians who have died in nonviolent direct action resistance to the wall during the years 2004 and 2005. They range in age from 14 years to 72 years of age, and I just want you to know about them. Um, Mubarak, would you read their names? My, I, I was going to do it, but if you would just read their names, <laughs> I, I would be very happy to have them remembered here this morning. Daya Abdul Karim, Abu Eid, 24 years, Badri Khaled, Mbiddo, 18 years, Muhammad Dahoud Badwan, 21 years, from Mbiddo, Abdul Rahman Abu Eid, 62 years from Biddo. Zakaria Muhammad Salim, 72 years from Bid Tetza. Muhammad Adil Rayyan, 26 years. Hussein Al Awni, 17 years. Jamal Jabir Ibrahim, 15 years. Ode Mufid Muhammad, 14 years, Mahmoud Nimer, 15 years. Thank you. Rachel um, 
Rachel's words continue to guide me, and I'd just like to close with something that she had to say. She said, I think freedom for Palestine could be an incredible source of hope to people struggling all over the world. I think it could also be an incredible inspiration to Arab people in the Middle East who are struggling under undemocratic regimes, which the U.S. supports. I look forward to increasing numbers of middle-class, privileged people like you and me becoming aware of the structure that supports our privilege and beginning to support the work of those who aren't privileged to dismantle those structures. I look forward to more moments like February 15th when civil society wakes up en masse and issues massive and resonant evidence of its conscience, its unwillingness to be repressed, and its compassion for the suffering of others. I look forward to more teachers emerging like Matt Grant and Barbara Weaver and Dale Knuth who teach critical thinking to kids in the United States. I look forward to the international resistance that's occurring now, fertilizing analysis on all kinds of issues with dialogue between diverse groups of people. I look forward to all of us who are new at this, developing better skills for working in democratic structures and healing our own racism and classism and sexism and heterosexism and ageism and ableism and becoming more effective. Thank you. Good morning. born in Palestine, in Jerusalem, and uh, I've always, uh, it's a surprise for me, but it's a great, great way of seeing things in a different way. Being a Palestinian, to be tortured because of Palestinian, to be imprisoned as a Palestinian, to be deported as a Palestinian, I say that's all right because I'm a Palestinian. But what about others who are helping the Palestinians? What other about Jews, about Israelis, about international groups, about church groups? They are willing to suffer on behalf of the Palestinians. And I always wonder why they are doing that. Why they are doing that? Why churches or Jews like Anne, like Jeff, even people who have been killed on our behalf. Why they are doing that? Why they think of our suffering becomes important that it becomes their suffering. I want to tell you two stories because I'm going to do more of a lengthy one on creative nonviolence. But it becomes an important for me to be very thankful for those who have nothing to do with the Palestinians and they could wash their hands and say, hey, that's their problem. But they commit themselves to come and help the Palestinians. I mean, we are so much grateful for them. Not only they inspire us, but also they keep us continuing. I mean, one incident, I was in jail, and there's a fellow by the name of Eddie Kaufman. And I went on a hunger strike in jail. And Jonathan Gutta was my attorney. He came and he told me, there's a fellow outside the prison is going on a hunger strike. He's not fat as you are. <laughs> He's skinny. And you better do something about it. <laughs> and I was so upset, so angry. And I say, why a Jew, an Israeli, going on a hunger strike, hunger strike for my sake? Why? What it is in him to do that? Not only that, he will sit under a tree 
and other people who are Israelis come and spit at him that he had to bring his son, who is a pilot in the military, to watch for him so that nobody will spit at him. How come you as a Jew go on hunger strike for a Palestinian? I was forced to stop my hunger strike. <laughs> and that upset me. But that's what happened. Another a similar story like that, which is very fascinating, because I have to tell you about the Palestinians themselves. The Israeli went to Hebron and they blocked stores of merchants. And the decision was made that, okay, they blocked the stores of merchants, they put a big fence around them, and nobody is going over there to buy anything. They kept a very, very narrow place that they, anybody could go and buy anything from those merchants. So a simple thing what we did, we start going from Jerusalem, from Nablus, from Ramallah, with buses to ask everybody to come and shop in those shops of Hebrew, so that they'll have income. Not only that, for anybody who shops, we have a ticket, a lottery ticket, and we have Palestinians say, anybody who goes to shop, we will give them television. And if, even if you shop for $10, you'll get the television for $500. So the idea of the Palestinians who are struggling with others, it's there. They don't have much, but they are willing to give everything they have for others. And that's why you have to understand the Palestinian strength of continuing the effort of resisting occupation. In another time, that we have been training villages, and you saw how the villages are very vulnerable. And we were training villages, and I was invited to go to the village after the training to have a very big dinner. And in Palestinian culture, women are supposed to cook. And suddenly, we have food that is already made, and uh, and then one of the ladies, she said, hey, you came and you trained us very well, and then she gave me the bill. <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh, now that is a non-violence training. <laughs> that they didn't cook or waste their time cooking, they were in the workshop being trained. And whenever you see that, then you say that we are on the right track. As much as we are in the worst situation, we have to think of the justice, the spirit, <coughs> and the good comrade between each other. And we have nothing to fear when we see each other as human beings. I want to tell one short story from the Bethlehem area. In 2002, we were under almost seven months, if you add it all up, a 24 hour a day curfew in 2002. And when the tanks are running down the street and you're under the curfew and the helicopters are flying, it's a little hard to do active uh, nonviolent resistance to get people to, to come out. But what would happen when the curfew was over is the soldiers would go through and they would they'd drive through and announce on the jeeps that the curfew was over, you could go out for however many hours uh, and then go back. We had been under a four-day curfew, 24 hours, and the call came out, and there was this, suddenly it came across the television screens and across from the, uh, the mosque and the museum saying, don't go. Not a single person left their house. And it was an interesting thing to watch what happened because the soldiers were getting increasingly irritated <laughs> and frustrated because nobody would go out. They, kept, they were starting to yell, you must go, you must go, you must go. And the more they yelled, the more you could hear people uh, in their houses starting to laugh. Um, and I live with a very apolitical family, and even for them, you should see just that moment of saying, we're not going to be animals that you say go and don't go. And so we're not going to go. We haven't been out for four days. We don't care if you don't let us out for another four. We're going to stay. You know, it was a... You wouldn't think maybe that was a courageous act, but it was a moment of defiance of saying, we are not just animals. And it was so empowering, even inside the household, of people saying, in a, in a, 
mainly because the soldiers continued to get more and more frustrated and people were enjoying their frustration uh, because nobody would go out and they weren't going to drag everyone out. So there are lots of ways in which the resistance continues to be present. Uh, I think you know, we've got some questions for the panel. So. I would like to bring a microphone to you if you have a question. I'll try and Again, you can ask the questions either directly to APAL or in general, as you like. Yeah, this is in general. I, as I watch this, and over the last couple of years, I keep finding myself irritated by my 40-hour-a-week job because I want to do peace work full-time. And I, I look on there and I think about, you know, there may be some discussion at some point about the logistics of, of the economics, logistics of dropping everything dropping your jobs and going to uh, peace work full time. It might be an order, I don't know if you can answer that there, but maybe some insight on that, or maybe a future discussion for another workshop. Don't do it. Peace work, it's very unfortunately, doesn't give you a good house, a good car, anything, you always will be on poverty. If you want really, for, for the young people, if you want really to have a peace work and to have, you have to have another job. And that job should support you. Don't ever depend on your church or on your community fully to support you for peace. Because if peace doesn't come, they said, all the money is wasted. So have a good job and then work for peace. I have a counter experience. Um, I, uh, I was an English teacher abroad until I went to Palestine and decided to start touring with my presentation. And I just uh, this, earlier this year did a four month sort of marathon tour around the country, going to almost 30 states and giving more than 100 um, talks that you just saw. Um, and uh, I found that I actually um, received so many book purchases and donations um, far, far more than I ever um, was able to uh, earn teaching, and that I've actually now, with my touring, been able to um, actually support a number of organizations in Palestine, give a lot of money uh, to them, as well as support myself. And um, so there, there is a way. Uh, I don't know. I think it's uh, a lot of it's luck and a lot of it's privilege, um, but I think that there is a way. I'd like somebody on the panel to uh, address the dichotomy of effectiveness uh, of, of nonviolence versus uh, the spiritual uh, aspects. All too often, you know, uh, the Gene Sharp School of, of Nonviolence, and, and I believe it very much, says that the most effective way for Palestinians to resist is, in fact, nonviolence. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm increasingly feeling that there is a power uh, and a virtue uh, and, 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 and spiritual power in doing nonviolence, even though you can't point out to an exact uh, effectiveness. Uh, so I'd like for somebody to, to address this dichotomy. We we're told it doesn't work. But, but at, at some deep level, it seems to, 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 to have value in and of itself, regardless of whether it achieves the, the, the result of stopping the war or ending the occupation. I'm not the spiritual guy here, but, <laughs> but, I, would, but I would certainly bring out the moral, the moral issue. On, by the way, the last question, you know, I asked Che Guevara once, what, what can I do, somebody asked, what can I do to further the revolution? And he said, I used to be a doctor. So, um, I think, you know, I, I have, I don't know, I, to tell you the truth, I'm thoroughly secular, and I resist the faith things for all kinds of reasons. But there is an article of faith, I don't know if you call it faith, or at some point I'd like to research and see if it's true. 
that I think gets to some of this, and that is that I believe injustice is unsustainable. That would be a good bumper sticker. That injustice is unsustainable. That it, it contains the seeds of its own destruction. I mean, injustice has to be exploited. It has to be violent. Uh, it ha you know, the, the people being oppressed can never agree with it, can never go along with it, it can never be routinized, it can never be normalized. You know, we had this uh, poignant moment in Israel where uh, at the beginning of the Lebanon War, Ulmer, the Prime Minister, gets up at the Knesset and says, we have a right to be normal just like everybody else in the world. <laughs> you know, as if you can have an occupation and still demand to be normal somehow, to make that compartment, like Noam's talking about, compartmentalization. We have our normal life, and okay, we have an occupation, but that's something else that's not part of the equation. I think that, uh, that injustice is, um, is unsustainable, and what, what keeps me going is uh, there was a, a fellow named Miles Horton. We ran, the, we used to, we founded a Highlander school in Tennessee, some of you might know, a real radical school for change, uh, who, who used to talk about the long haul. He says, you're in for the long haul. You know, this isn't something that's gonna, you're, you're battling tremendous political, cultural, historical, economic forces, and you're not gonna win in a year or two. And the occupation is connect, it's not localized. It's a part of the global struggle. It's connected to Iraq, it's connected to um, to militarism, it's connected to real politique, to the global system. And you know, if you take a substantial piece of social justice, uh, it, it, it's your life's work, in a sense. Whether you do it in the, in, integrate it with your own career, or you carve out a career uh, in which you can devote yourself full time, it becomes your life's work. And part of that, of course, is a moral, is certainly a moral dimension, because I think the effectiveness of the sanctions in South Africa wasn't so much the economic part of it. I think South Africa could have weathered the economic sanctions, but it was the, mor it was the moral part of it, where it was isolated, it felt morally isolated. Churches certainly took the lead in leading the struggle against apartheid. Businesses didn't want to be associated with South Africa and, and began to pull their operations out. So I really think uh, that the moral aspect of what we're doing is crucial in rendering injustice unsustainable. So if you ask a spiritual question, you're going to get another answer from somebody who's quite not religious. Um, and less optimistic than Jeff, because I think injustice is quite sustainable. But from a moral perspective, um, if you act unjustly to fix injustice, then you're increasing the injustice. Um, and even if it's completely ineffective, even in the long run, or at least as far as we can see, it's still only increasing the injustice. So I find utility to be completely and utterly, um, almost utterly irrelevant when I think of non-violence or violence. Um, I do it from a deontological philosophical point of view, not from a religious one, but it's, a, it's the same action. You know? Can we, can we do a spiritual answer? I mean, for those of us who do follow a spiritual uh, standpoint, uh, uh, it is a I mean, nonviolence can be a strategic tool. And for some, it's one tool among many in a form of resistance. And so, it, so it's not based on a sort of a, a, a soul force uh, identity that comes out of my way of being. I think for those of us who come out of religious traditions where nonviolence um, is very deeply connected to our, our spiritual well-being and our, our trying to figure out what it means to be faithful, that it does give you the power to continue even though you don't see the results on the end. I think there is a transformation that keeps, that allows the strength to continue so that you can continue to resist because it, it helps you maintain your sense of soul. You don't do it because necessarily because of the other or even the result. But you just, basically is just in a very traditional Christian line to save your soul in the sense of trying to keep yourself whole. Um, and you hope that you win the soul of the other. I mean, that was Martin Luther King's issue, that in that you, you win each other's souls. Uh, and uh, so there is a difference. And there are people who are engaged in nonviolent resistance who don't do it. 
from a spiritual standpoint, but I think for those of us who, who are motivated out of that, it does transform who we are, and it does give you the power to sustain and continue that, even in the face of incredible opposition. I just want to add to the conversation rather than to ask a question. Uh, since this is a primarily a Christian conference, I wanted to add a bit of a Buddhist perspective. Um, I was fortunate to attend a conference on Thomas Merton last year. Uh, the primary speaker was uh, Bob Thurman, who was the head of Tibet House in New York. And he was telling about the publication of his book without giving him all of Thurman's philosophy. Of course, you know, as a Buddhist, you come back, and you come back, and you come back. Um, so the title of his book was Infinite Life. And as Thurman tells the story, he says, I'm sitting across my publisher, and the publisher says, Bob, wow, you can't promise them eternal life. You've got to change the title of this book. He says, look, I don't want to promise them eternal life. I want to threaten them with it. <laughs> so the point I think is obvious. If you don't do it now, you're going to have to do it later. So you don't put it up. This is mainly for you, being, um, as you describe yourself, as a privilege, being an Israeli and Jewish. Could you talk about the reception you get when you go into Palestine? Uh, I know a lot of it's been great. Could you talk about any other circumstances or general reception you have for you there as the other side? So my experience has been, uh, almost without exception, that I've been uh, warmly welcomed into people's homes and lives. In fact, they, they won't want me to go up to a demonstration, they'll want me to, <laughs> to stay and drink tea with them. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's incredible, it's uh, actually, um, it, it, it's, it's hard actually to take um, that much generosity from people who've lost so much, um, uh, feeling myself as a, that I'm a privileged person. Um, the, um, well, let me, let me pass the mic, I might have some of yeah, no, I have the same experience. I think, you know, people are people, and if you come to them as people and uh, are trying to understand, you know, where they're coming from, their issues, and uh, and you listen and you're concerned, uh, there's never, uh, you know, that's, I think, the anthropological experience. I mean, anthropologists, I'm an anthropologist, I have that experience in every culture. Um, and I, you know, and, I just, I just resist the idea of sides. We say there are, there are, for me there's no sides. Um, you know, every, or at least the sides don't break down Israeli, Palestinian, Jewish, and so on. That if um, everyone from my point of view who, who supports human rights, uh, inclusion, nonviolence, justice, peace, love, the values that, that, that we represent, is on my side, and it's those. If there is another side, it's those that are that, that that further, you know, domination and militarism and exclusivity and privilege. They're on the other side, and I think that's the way. That's the way it breaks down. I do want to just take one second. I mean, it might be embarrassing for. for you. I, I haven't met you. There's a, a Jewish fellow from the local community in the audience, and I, I don't. I haven't met. But I did want to acknowledge it, to acknowledge that as well. That that I think uh, you know it's interesting. There are two Israelis and an American Jew on this panel, and uh, and certainly there's been an, an effort to be inclusive, and it, it does take a certain amount of courage. And I, I want to uh, say a word of appreciation of someone from the local Kansas City, I assume, or, or uh, you know Jewish community who, who's come here. And I think um, um, I told Dick Toll. And some other people that I want to try to see if we can if we can have a Seville meeting jointly sponsored by a synagogue in the United States at some point. <laughs> but believe me, uh, people in the American Jewish community that that come to a conference like this, I think, are more in the line of fire than than I am in Palestine. And that is a lesson that I have learned from Palestinians and maybe others can too. But that 
in general, I find when I, you know, when I walk into a Palestinian village, um, you know, people are curious, maybe even a little bit suspicious. Who is this Yabanji? Who is this uh, stranger? And um, and but but, it's, but I tell them I'm American. They ask, well, what do you think about what Bush is doing? And I and I tell my opinion, and they say, what do you think about? You know, if I'm Jewish, they say, what do you think about it? What Israel is doing? I tell them my opinion. That's all it takes. Then it's done. They understand that I'm there not as an aggressor, but as someone to witness what they're experiencing and to be in solidarity with them. And I find that Palestinians um, and, and people from many parts of that part of the world are much better at distinguishing between a government and a people uh, than, than we are. And I, I, I try to now take that um, advice and, and sort of apply it in my understanding of people around the world. We have time for one more question. Uh, you might get two in, so. Uh, what opportunities do the Palestinians have to do their own businesses now? Operate a business, own a business, start a business? Uh, I think, uh, I don't have the statistics, but in regard to Gaza, really it's terrible. I mean, I think unemployment is more than 60%. Um, on that. So they cannot do anything without going out of Gaza to do any business or to get any materials. Sometimes they get it or sometimes they don't. And if you are a farmer that you want to have your uh, potatoes or apples or oranges or tomatoes outside, sometimes it will put them on the way because they wouldn't allow it in. So business is completely bad. Also in Bethlehem, I mean, the majority of Bethlehem people are waiting for tourism to come, or tourists to come. But uh, many, many Christians, they would uh, come for really around probably half an hour. They quickly go in and see where Christ was born and quickly go back. And they, were, they are being told, don't ever talk to those Palestinians, don't talk to them, they might they will threaten you to talk to any Palestinians. And that's why many Christians in the United States, when they go there, they don't think that there are Palestinian Christians. So the tourism is dead even in the town of Bethlehem as well as in Jerusalem. In other areas, it's completely, completely, I don't know if anybody mentioned it, but from 1967, business-wise, it was better than what it is we have today. It's so bad. It seems like in order for a nonviolent protest to be successful, you have to be able to induce shame in the target of the nonviolent protest. Um, this conference talks about education and not economic support of what's going on in Palestine. But, uh, and also that ultimately the United States is responsible for a lot of what's going on. It's been historically hard to engage Americans in something that's going on halfway around the world. So are there opportunities for nonviolent protest in this country? We're not on the forefront of house demolitions, but we are on the forefront on the, on the front line of the political process which sustains this.
uh, this could not continue in the way that it is. So, um, you know, I think, that, I think that that aspect of things is terribly important. I know that Phyllis Dennis will be talking in a workshop about the work of the U.S. campaign to end the occupation, which focuses on uh, lobbying. There are other groups. I really encourage everybody in the room to find a group to connect to. And uh, Churches for Middle East Peace puts out, uh, you can get on their listserv, and they will put out uh, calls to action things that you can do. Jewish Voice for Peace uh, does wonderful work. Fritz Zedek is putting out some wonderful things in terms of lobbying. So I think that the most important thing is to stay connected to what's happening uh, by being connected to one of these groups that can alert you uh, to the actions that you can individually take. And then in your own communities, uh, to, to form groups, uh, to, to look and see if there are groups, um, one of the things in our own community of Olympia, Washington, uh, that happened in 2004 in Gaza, uh, there was Operation Rainbow, which was a terribly violent time. And we had a protest on the streets of Olympia. Uh, one of Rachel's dreams was to have a sister city relationship between Rafa and Olympia, and uh, friends have um, made that a reality. And we had a protest. Uh, remember our sis Remember what's happening to our sister city, Rafa. I sometimes think it, it was maybe the only place in the world where there was a, a protest going on that day about Rafa. But I, I think you can do those sorts of things. And the media came and they wrote about it in our local paper and so forth. So uh, there, there's different kinds of action. One thing uh, Jeff and I were talking about is that next year is the 40th anniversary of uh, the, the 67 War of the Occupation. And uh, already um, there are plans underfoot, and, and I think we need to be talking about it a lot to make, um, I think June 9th is the international day that's been designated as a global day of action. June 5th is the actual anniversary date. But uh, I think, uh, I'm, I'm hoping maybe we can provide some of the leadership for that. But that should be a, a very, very, very big day in this country in terms of street protest or whatever. I don't know how it's going to manifest itself. Maybe you've got the ideas. But um, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I first. First of all, I would like to reiterate uh, what was said in terms of Palestinians also say to me, we love having you uh, in Palestine, but we'd rather have you in the U.S. So there's no shame in not being able to go to Palestine or not wanting to go to Palestine. The most important work that we have is in this country. Um, and I do believe that there is value in lobbying um, and voting. Um, but I went to see Cindy Sheehan speak um, a couple nights ago, and she talked a lot about um, how given the, the current uh, the voting machines and system um, that Ohio was clearly stolen in 2004, uh, that Florida was clearly stolen in 2000, it seems very clear that we cannot simply rely on the democratic process anymore. Um, real changes in this country have never come from the top down. It's come from the bottom up. It's come from the grassroots resistance. And so please, please vote in a week or two weeks. You know, yes, do vote, but that's not that, that's not enough. Um, people have to people have to start making sacrifices. Quit your job. I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I know, I know, I know. Get out the streets. And I want to say that one of the best resources that I know in this entire country on this topic is Joe Park. Please stand up, Joe. And Joe Park. Joe, Joe should have been on this panel. He is full of great ideas of not only you know top-down stuff, but most importantly, bottom-up, grassroots, direct action, getting on the streets, not just you know vigils, but actually putting your body on the line. That's what it's going to take. The question is, are you going to be one of those people that does it? Um, and I want to say as well, my handout, there's ideas for taking action. There are resources, websites you can go to, groups you can join, as well as talking to Joe Carr. Those handouts, by the way, have been copied. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, we really, we really can't. We're going to try to get you back on time. Because you said, I mean, what? You're the one who's asking me to put time. So, <laughs> 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 and she makes it really quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, okay. First of all, on April 15th, tax day, I'm a little bit of Judy Sheehan was speaking at the Peace and Justice Expo, which I'm having to organize. 
And uh, second, I worked with fifth graders in elementary school, and it changed me every morning to say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Connection to the Republic for which it stands, and I know it's not delivering peace and justice for everyone, but I say it, it what I want to do is talk to children about what America is not doing right yet, and what we could do differently. How do you do that within the system, which is just teaching them to honor, you know, and mechanically salute the flag? We, we, we want one word on this? Okay. That's a short question. One word. Um, I really think we're going to talk about it a little bit in my workshop. Reframing, I think, is really important. In other words, I think we all have, we have positions, you've heard a lot of good things today. It links up to a lot of other issues in the United States and global issues. What the public is missing, I think everything is too fragmented. What the public is missing is a good, coherent framing. It could be an American reframing in terms of how does this conflict are linked up to other conflicts and impact on the Americans. We have, you have to bring it home. How does this impact on the American people? And there can also be a Christian reframing. You know, I do a human rights reframing. There's a, there's a, a Jewish reframing for the Jewish community. I think a Christian reframing in which, uh, like, like Jonathan says, you take some of the key elements uh, in the Christian faith and the language, and then you use that to reach audiences in other words, you have to go to where the people are, and I really believe that reframing is a crucial step uh, before any kind of effective campaigning takes place. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Sandra. Uh